Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? Holiday weekend, the first official weekend of summer. I can see several people are out holidaying today, but that's good. I'm glad you're all here. Oh, uh, does it ever seem to you like time just goes faster and faster and faster? I can't believe it. You know, it was just the first of the year not too long ago. Now we're halfway through the year almost. It's uh, it's incredible, and the days just go by so fast before you even hardly get started. It's dark, and you wonder what happened. Of course, maybe that's a symptom of being a farmer and a rancher. You, you never can get enough done. So, All right, let's share a few announcements before I blather on too much. Uh, there's not very much in here today. Rem- remember Memorial Day. Remember the people who served. Um, evening Bible class tonight at 6.15. I see there's a question mark by that. You will be here. Okay. All right. All right. So look forward to that for you guys that can make it. Um, on the back of the front page are ministries, our Bible studies, and prayer meetings. Um, so I encourage you again to be with one, be in prayer to see if one of those places can fit into your schedule so that you can be with other members of the church family during the week and not just on Sundays. So that's about all the announcements I have. I think we'll do some singing before I get carried away. <laughs> Thank you, Johnny. You know what? Hang on. He's right. I forgot the visitors. And there's a card laying right here to remind me. Got to retrain me about every Sunday. Do we have any visitors here today? Yes? Would you like to introduce yourself? Hey, glad to see you today. Thank you for coming. Is there anybody else? Well, if you're a visitor here today, we are so thankful to see you, and I hope everybody comes and shakes your hand and says hello, gives you a big Wiley Union howdy. If you're a visitor here today, I'd encourage you to look in a seat back in front of you, and you'll see a little card in there in the pocket, and just put a little information in there and drop it in the offering when that goes by, just so we have a record of your attendance. We appreciate that. Thank you for being here. Now, thank you, John. Stand with me, if you would please, and turn in your head. Okay. 804. This is Memorial Weekend, and we want to remember our veterans, but we are in a spiritual battle, aren't we? And that's what this is. My eyes are seeing the Lord.
This morning I'm going to read from the book of Mark, chapter 9, verses 23 through 27. <clears throat> then Jesus looked around and said to his disciple, disciples, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this wonderful day. We thank you for this opportunity to gather together in your name, Heavenly Father. We thank you for our church family here. We ask you to be with us, be among us as we listen to the sermon and sing today. We ask you to be with Pastor Todd as he teaches from your word, Heavenly Father. We ask that you be with the other members of our church family who, for other reasons, are not here today, whether they are with their family or celebrating. Heavenly Father, we just ask that you give us all safety and guidance. We ask that you be with us each day as we go out and do your will, Heavenly Father. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, good morning, and happy Memorial Day to you, or weekend to you. This is a day, or tomorrow really, is the day that we observe those who have died on the battlefield in service for our country, and it's separate from Veterans Day, where we celebrate and recognize those who have served and also have returned home, but we do recognize that those who have served in our armed forces have done so with the knowledge that they may have to pay that ultimate sacrifice. And today as we celebrate the lives of those who came before us, who secured the freedoms in which we are able to gather here today in support of, and their death supporting that for us, we do want to recognize those of you veterans who have been willing to make that sacrifice, not for your service, but for your willingness to die on behalf of the principles of liberty and freedom for which this nation was founded upon. So real quickly, if you have served in the armed forces, just would you stand up for us and we can recognize that willingness that you have. Uh, we appreciate you so willingly going into the armed forces with the recognition that it may lead to what we would be celebrating today. And we're grateful that you are with us as well. Just real quickly, since 1775 until 2019, there's been an estimated 1.354 million deaths of U.S. soldiers. That's not including the wounded. If you add the wounded in there and the, all of the skirmishes and the wars and the different deployments that our military has seen, you go up to just under 
3 million with deaths and casualties. 1775 to 2019. The leading cause uh, or leading contributor to that was World War II. 291,557 deaths attributed just to that war alone. And then following that closely was the American Civil War, which had roughly 215,000 U.S. citizen deaths and soldier deaths. So uh, we want to recognize that while we are in a great nation, it has come at a price and a cost. One that was willingly given by those who served on our behalf and on behalf of the freedoms and the principles established when this nation was founded and declared independent, when it declared itself independent as the colonies from Great Britain. I've got a couple of other things here real quickly. Um, I want to read to you just in the spirit of the celebration that we have today and the recognition of those who came before us. This is a prayer from one of the greatest generals of the U.S. Army. It says, Eternal and everlasting God, I presume, presume to present myself this morning before thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to accept my humble and hearty thanks, that it hath pleased thy great goodness to keep and preserve me the night past from all the dangers poor mortals are subject to, and has given me sweet and pleasant sleep, whereby I find my body refreshed and comforted for performing the duties of this day, in which I beseech thee to defend me from all perils of body and soul. Direct my thoughts, words, and work. Wash away my sins in the immaculate blood of the Lamb, and purge my heart by thy Holy Spirit. From the dross of my natural corruption, that I may with more freedom of mind and liberty of will serve thee, the everlasting God, in righteousness and holiness this day, and all the days of my life. Increase my faith in the sweet promises of the gospel. Give me repentance from dead works. Part of my wanderings and direct my thoughts unto thyself, the God of my salvation. Teach me how to live in thy fear, labor in thy service, and ever to run in the ways of thy commandments. Make me always watchful over my heart, that neither the terrors of conscience, the loathing of holy duties, the love of sin, nor an unwillingness to depart this life may cast me into a spiritual slumber. But daily frame me more and more into the likeness of thy Son, Jesus Christ, that living in thy fear and dying in thy, thy favor, I may in thy appointed time attain to the resurrection of the just unto eternal life. Bless my family, friends, and kindred. Unite us all in praising and glorifying thee in all our works begun, continued, and ended, when we shall come to make our last account before thee, blessed Savior, who has taught us to pray, our Father. And if you wanted to know who that general was, that's General George Washington, the first elected president of the United States of America, largely because of his character. I've enjoyed snippets of his writings. Uh, this is a book called Sacred Fire. And I put the prayer, I printed out and clipped it to that book because we have been told that the founding fathers and those who established this nation did not do so on Judeo-Christian principles. They did not do so with the principles of God-given liberty in mind. And you can't read our documents that established this nation without that. Of the documents that I mentioned the Declaration of Independence, the last line, identifies that when they signed on, they recognized that they were signing the war with Britain, and they were willing to die on behalf of the freedom and the principles. It wasn't flippant. It wasn't a rebellious action. It was a revolution based upon biblical principle. And the reason I clipped that paper where I did is because this is all just George Washington's essays and copies, photographs of them right here. And then this is all footnotes supporting everything that is contained here. Appendixes and footnotes. So don't misunderstand history for lack of research. There's plenty to see there. And I'm going to bring in this one real quickly, too, as well. This one's a book called America's God and Country. It's put together by William J. Federer. And it's an encyclopedia of quotations. I, I was going to go through here and pick certain ones to read. But as I started flipping through, it doesn't matter where you flip. So let's just take my four of them. Here's Herbert Clark Hoover, 31st President of the United States. He says in his inaugural address, March 4th, 1929, This occasion is not alone the administration 
of the most sacred, sacred oath which can be assumed by an American citizen is a dedication and consecration under God to the highest office and service of our people. I assume this trust in the humility of knowledge that only through the guidance of Almighty Providence can I hope to discharge its ever-increasing burdens. I ask the help of Almighty God in this service. That was 1929. Let's flip forward a little bit here. Christopher Columbus, in his book entitled Book of Prophecies, wrote, My hope in the one who created us all sustains me. He is an ever-present help in trouble. When I was extremely depressed, he raised me with his right hand, saying, O man of little faith, get up. It is I. Do not be afraid. He also uses in his signature, encased in a triangular pattern, different abbreviations, and they all abbreviate the Hebrew terms for Almighty God, Lord God, and the other term, one, one which is Christ bearer. That's part of his signature. A couple more here, and then we will progress on this morning. Try to find some names that we might be more familiar with here. Here's John Adams, a name we should know well. He says, on December 25th, in a letter to Thomas Jefferson, I have examined all religions as well as my narrow sphere, my straightened means, and my busy life would allow. And the result is that the Bible is the best book in the world. It contains more philosophy than all the other libraries I have seen. And then lastly, the Declaration of Independence, July 2nd, 1776, where the wording was approved by the Continental Congress. They signed the parchment and it read, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary, for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitles them. It trims off a number of these things. It, what it does here at this point is it goes in and talks about all the reasons behind their declaration. declaration. It's the difference between a rebellion and a revolution. A revolution is founded on principle. A rebellion is founded upon the sin nature, and we don't want that. We'll deal with that later. But he comes in and they say, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in general Congress, assembled appealing to the supreme judge of the world, capital S, capital J, talking about God the Father, for the rectitude of our intentions and for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortune, fortunes, and our sacred honor. That was the beginning framework for the Declaration of Independence that, had, that started the American Revolution with Great Britain. Well, we could spend our time reading more of those things. In fact, I've got one more up here to read to you. But I will leave it off because while we enjoy and celebrate what we have as American citizens because of those willing to pay the ultimate sacrifice for us to enjoy these things. We are here to worship God as Christians in this great nation. And so our focus today, while we memorialize the sacrifices made, our focus today will not be on the sacrifice of the patriots who gave us the freedom as Americans, but upon Jesus Christ who at his sacrifice gave us the freedom from our sin nature and we'll begin to look at that this morning. But while we get to that, I'm going to pull out your prayer letter. It's the same thing as your bulletin nowadays. We do have a few updates for you. Louise Bateman had a rough week. You, we mentioned her last Sunday as well to you. Uh, she was... She suffered a couple of different falls, and they were not sure if she had had some strokes or if it was just being off balance, but she is finally, after having fractured her jaw and a couple of other bones, and I believe her shoulder was fractured as well, but I could be incorrect on that. That may have been one of the first um, assumptions. But she is now back at Apple Creek, uh, and she is receiving hospice care there as well, 
and she is actually able to have visitors. If you are curious about doing so, there's a protocol to go through, but if you wanted to visit Louise, I understand church family members can go visit her according to Apple Creek facility. Uh, so keep her in your prayers. And they did run a CT scan that showed no sign of stroke or seizure, so that is a huge praise, and we're grateful for that. Colleen Buckley uh, was diagnosed with bursitis in her hip, and she was, so she has started a new medicine for inflammation, and bursitis, if you've had it, is very painful, and so you understand better than the rest of us. And also Shirley Jolly, number eight on the list, uh, she is going blind with macular degeneration, and that seems to be the result of something that came out, out, of, out of her COVID shot, but I don't know that we know that for certain. Um, so pray for her in that as she deals with the loss of vision that she is facing. Um, look over these things and keep them in mind. Pastor Terry is not here with his family um, today because they are actually at a Memorial Day gathering for their family, and they're enjoying that time together. And so we, should, we will expect him back next week as he uh, sees fit. And he has indicated that that is his desire. So uh, it looks like he is ready to join back up with what he has been given by God to do here. And we'll support him as he does so and give him whatever grace he needs and whatever support he needs in that transition as well. So keep praying for them and pray for him as he comes back next week, Lord willing, and we'll see where God takes this. If you have a update for these things, go ahead and let Teresa know in the, in the office or leave it with me and I will gladly get that to her and get you get that update on the prayer list, whether it's a new one or a correction. Um, I did notice that the coffee's friend is in there now instead of Nancy's friend. Um, going back to, uh, what was that, number number nine, Ryan McNeese. I, we did get that correction in there, so if you're curious about that, it's the coffee's friend. Uh, so finally we got that correction in there. But if the men will come forward, we'll collect your offering. Verna Wisner is playing the offertory for us, and let's pray and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you that we can go to your throne room because your Son has paid the penalty for our sins, set us free from the judgment that we would face from our sin natures if we were to approach your throne, having not been clothed in the blood of the Lamb. And as we gather this morning to memorialize those who in this nation have supported your principles that you have established from the very beginning. And we do so recognizing that they are not just the noblest of men, but that they are facing behind their nobility and behind their actions the true judge, the one who judges beyond this world, but judges the sins of man. And we keep in mind that mortality that we have as humans gives us the opportunity to recognize your infiniteness and the eternal nature that you have and as we do so may we find ourselves lowering ourselves underneath you to worship and to adore you for who you are in jesus name amen
How great thou art. We serve a great and mighty God, don't we, today? Stand with me again, if you would, please. 786, count your blessings. One of the blessings... Thank you, Lauren. Well, I remember a time where you could roam about as you pleased, where you didn't have to worry about staying away from any other person or coming into contact with someone who disagreed with your personal belief about what you should or should not be doing. Remember a time where you didn't have to question where you went and what you did. All you had to do was just walk with God moment by moment and focus on your relationship with Him. Well, it was a long, long time ago for that time, and I only remember that time because it's recorded for me in God's Word. Oh, you thought I was talking about a couple years ago? Yeah. You were set up. No, I wasn't talking about masks or vaccines or COVID or social distancing or how many pews we could have in the church building. I wasn't talking about that freedom. I was talking about the freedom of man who has not fallen. Genesis chapter 1 20, and chapter 2 tell us of a time when we did not have a sin nature. A time where Adam and his woman in the garden were working and walking and talking and learning from the God of the universe who had set up all that they needed to prove his righteousness to Satan and company. And I would have loved to have been able to keep reading in chapter 3 and 4 and 5 and all the way through the rest of Genesis to hear all that they did with God. But Genesis chapter 3 
The serpent became more crafty than any of the beasts of the field, and he came in and he deceived the woman, and she ate and gave to her husband, and he ate with her the fruit that God had forbidden them to eat. And in that bite, the headship of the family upon the man, the authority of the man that God had given to be his representative, along with his wife as one together, plunged all of humanity into a non-free state, a state that lacked spiritual life, that lacked the opportunity then to interact and participate with God spirit to spirit as we were created in Genesis 1, 26 and 27 in his likeness, the Hebrew word demut, meaning similar in former nature, having a spiritual nature to our creation. So while I say I remember that time, it's not because I was able to live there. It's because God has told us about that time. And there will be a time to come in which we, you and I, who have trusted Christ to be our Savior, will enjoy that freedom. Not having the curse of the sin nature within our body, this wretched body that it is, but having that b removed from us in a new body where we can go back to worshiping and serving God solely and freely. What a time that will be. Jude tells us we are to wait eagerly for that salvation. Not the salvation of our souls from the lake of fire. That happens the moment you trust Christ to be your Savior. But the salvation of us from this body of death. Romans 7, Paul tells us that God has set us free from the body of this death that we are in. He praises God. In verses 24 and 25 he writes, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but with my flesh the law of sin. We still have the sin nature within us. We still have it because it's a part of this fallen body into which you and I were born and took our first breath as individuals. Our study this morning will begin in John chapter 8, if you've been trying to keep up with some of the references. Jesus in John chapter 8, specifically verses 31 to 36, that's where we're going to be jumping off from today. But he's talking to a group of Jews, and in the Jews and the group that he's talking to are Pharisees and scribes. Those whose responsibility was to instruct the Jews, to teach the Jews, to record for the Jews what they were to do generation after generation after generation. And instead of the Mosaic law, what ended up happening is we ended up getting a traditional law. As the fallen nature of man continued to interpret God's law, which he gave to Moses, and give additions and clarifications that were not based upon what God had directed, but based upon what man had directed. Now, obviously then, if you have the Son of God coming to earth, clarifying, hey, you're wrong in these areas. I am the resurrection and the life. I will bring forth salvation. It would bring some contention, would it not? With those who believe that their salvation is in the law and the keeping of its traditions. And so in John chapter 7 through chapter 8, we have this large conversation that Jesus has with the Pharisees and scribes. And it says at the end of verse 30 in chapter 8 that many of the Jews who were hearing what he was saying believed into him. Some of the Jews paying attention to what he said, that when he would be lifted up on the cross that they would know that he was the Son of Man, said, ah, this is the Messiah. After he gave his speech and his discourse, his persuasion toward the Jews that he was speaking to, amidst the Pharisees and the scribes' contention and argumentation and their questioning of what he was saying, some were able to hear and chose to believe. And so he turns his attention to them specifically, and this is what he says in John eight thirty one, Saying, therefore, Jesus... To those Jews who had believed him, notice the description. If you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you shall know the truth, verse 32, and the truth shall make you free. 
Now at this point, the Pharisees and the scribes, the entirety of the group, they jumped in to Jesus' statement. So Jesus was having a little statement with those who had believed him, but having heard what he said to the believing Jews, the Pharisees and the scribes and the other unbelieving Jews jump in, and they, they answered him, We are of Abraham's offspring and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say we shall become free? Boy, do we humans have a problem with memory. These are the Jews, the one who God saved out of the land of Egypt. Notice their appeal is that we are Abraham's offspring. Well, when Abraham was given the promise in Genesis chapter 12 that he would be the father of a great nation and that the nations would be blessed through him in Genesis 17 as well, we have an understanding that the Jews came from him and they are his seed. But before they got to the promised land, there was something that had to take place in the promised land. The Canaanites who were in the land of the time, their iniquity was not yet complete. And so we have roughly 800 to 1,000 years between Abraham's promise from God and the Jews being taken out of Egypt by Moses. Now what were they doing in Egypt were they not enslaved to the Egyptians? Was this not the basic foundational understanding of the Jewish history? The Passover taught of the coming of the Messiah. But what was the final plague that got them out of Egypt? Out of being enslaved to the Egyptians and under Pharaoh's charge? It was the Passover. Where the firstborn was struck down dead. So here they are with Jesus. Jesus says, hey... If you, to the believing ones, if you abide in my word, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And then these other guys jump in and say, hey, 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 we've never been enslaved to anyone. What do you mean we're going to be set free? Um, Jesus could have said, well, were you not slaves in Egypt? The offspring of Abram or Abraham? But he did not. He could have said, well, are you not under the Roman government right now? Being limited in that which you have been told to do by God, by their authority over you. He could have brought up both of those points. But see, as much as we can see in Scripture tells us that when Jesus makes his statements, he's not talking about the human nature viewpoint of things. He's not talking about the man's view of the world and how it works. So it wouldn't be fitting for him to go back to human history and point those things out because he's not focused on humanity and this world that we are in. No, he is focused on the spiritual realities. And so this is his answer to them in John eight thirty four. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. And the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. If therefore the son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Now we have some confusion here. What is Jesus talking about in being set free from? There's two different arenas that he is talking about here. First, he's talking to the believing Jews. What does he say to them? If you abide in my word... If you walk with me, you will be my disciples. And you will come to know experiential knowledge. To know something by putting together the facts with your walk. To combine the two together so that it works with you. We have a number of kids in youth group and it's always a fun time for them when they say, I won't be at youth group for the next six weeks. And go, ah, driver's ed. Yes, I'm getting my license. I'm getting my uh, permit. And I have to go through my driver's training. And there's a factual side of things, an academic side of things to their training, but there's also a practical or practiced side of their training. They learn the rules of the road. They learn the gas is on the right and the brake is on the left, some of them. <laughs> they learn to check your blind spot, and they do so by reading first, and then when they get in the car with the instructor, they have the knowledge they need to now try and put into practice. And that's the whole goal, that when they come out at the end of their driver's training, they have experiential knowledge, Knowledge based upon their experience with the facts in a situation on the road. 
And we really want them to succeed, do we not? Because we don't want to have to stay off the sidewalks and out the storefronts at the end of this driver's training for them. We want them to be good, safe drivers on the road. Experiential knowledge, Jesus says, comes from us abiding in his word. It's also, he says, in fact, I think it may even be in chapter 8 somewhere later, that the goal of being fruitful comes for, the result of being fruitful comes from abiding in him. God does not say, do these things and you will be fruitful. He says, abide, remain in me. That word abide means to make up, take up residence in him. Now you and I, we've gone through over the course of the last three or four years, step by step, a focus on understanding the difference between our position in Christ and our walk with him. The relationship we have where we walk with God or apart from God moment by moment, but the salvation that we have because we are in Christ and secure forever. Jesus talking to the believing Jews, he's not telling them, hey, if you'll trust me, they already have. He says, no, if you abide in my word, the word that's used there for word means the message that he is producing. When Jesus told Satan that man does not live on bread alone, but by the very word that comes from the mouth of God, he said it's the exact words that man lives spiritually off of from God. The direct giving of God's specific word, each word mattering. But Jesus says also that through walking, abiding in his message. And what was Jesus' message? Well, he testified to the Father. He testified to man's role in relationship with God and God's role in relationship with man. So his overall message teaches us how to walk with God through him and by faith in him. For us believers, walking with God is abiding in the word of Christ. We can't do one without the other. And that's how people will know that we are Jesus' disciples, that we are his followers, is that we abide in his message. We walk with God the way that he told us to do so. And he says that as a result of that, we shall get experiential knowledge of the truth. Right now, we are studying God's word. We can study it in depth. We can study it lightly. We can look at it on the surface or dig for 10 years down on three or four different words. But we're studying the facts when you get up out of the chair, you have to say, I will trust what God's word says, and I will put it to practice. And when I fail, I'll go, oh, I recognize that's not what God said, and we correct it, and we try it again. That's gaining the experiential knowledge. That's a walk with God. That's the Christian way of life. And it would have been great for him to continue to explain that for us, because we have to wait for the Apostle Paul. We have to wait for the Apostle Peter, other writings from the New Testament to explain how this process works. We've gone through these studies in the recent past. But Jesus was interrupted with this silly question of how can you say that we'll be free when we're not enslaved to anyone? Verse 34 is a critical verse to understand because now what we're doing here, Jesus is not talking to the believing Jews anymore. He's talking to the general group. And he's given a general principle. So the first group, the, Jew, the believing Jews, he says, okay, you're saved. Now if you abide in me, you will be seen as my disciples. You will be my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and it shall set you free. What were they being set free from there? Not the judgment that they would have received had they not believed, right? Believers have been set free from the lake of fire and its judgment. So what else can we be set free from? Oh, had we thought of that before? The workings of our sin nature in our thoughts, in our bodies, in its desires, its cravings, and its hungers. We can be renovated in our thought process and set free from the fallen viewpoint that we have had because we have walked by our sin nature for believers. And Jesus closes that conversation when he's interrupted by this other contest. It's a contentious question. The Greek text actually identifies for us that this is kind of a retorted question. They're challenging Jesus. That's why we know it's not the believing Jews in part. Also, if you look a few verses down around verses 38 to 39, um, or actually it's verse 40 where it says, you're, you are seeking to kill me. The believing Jews weren't seeking to kill him. So a little bit of harmony, a little context helps us out here. So he closes the conversation with the believing Jews that they can be set free while they walk with him. And he turns it back to those who interrupted. And he says, the one who commits sin is the slave of sin. 
If therefore the Son, verse 36, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. The Son makes man free from the penalty of sin and from the effect of the sin nature. It's authority over us. Now, the sin nature has a couple different types of authority over us. It has the master authority, as in a master-slave relationship, but also has a judicial authority over us. Because it's under our sin nature that we are judged for our sin. God the Father, the judge, judges man by their sins, and what produces the sins? Well, it's our sinful nature. So we have a judicial authority of the sin nature over man, but we also have a practical or experiential authority of the sin nature that is the sin nature as our master and us as its slave. And there's a general principle that Jesus brings in in verses 34 to 36 that says the one committing sin is the slave of sin. We're missing two words in the English translation. When Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin, the English New American Standard has left out the word the twice. And it, it's a little word, and in English, we look, don't, don't really care about it. But what it does from the Greek is it changes the focus entirely of the sentence. It's not focusing on what sin is and the qualities of the sin. It's talking about a specific sin. Oh, well, that does change things now, right? It's no longer just sin in general, but the sin. Everyone who commits the sin is the slave of the sin, is what Jesus says. What is the sin? It's rejection of Christ. You may have heard the term an unpardonable sin. What things can you do that God cannot forgive? There's only one. It's not adultery. It's not fornication. It's not murders. For such as there's and was, hopefully, some of us. No, it's rejection of the Holy Spirit's conviction that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And so when you speak against what the Holy Spirit is doing, that's the unpardonable sin. It's a failure to recognize what the Holy Spirit is saying about Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So Jesus says, all the ones that are committing the sin, rejection of me, by the Holy Spirit's conviction of them, they are slaves of the sin. And it's interesting That it's while we continue to reject Jesus as Christ that we continue to be the slaves of sin. Where do we get that continuation? Well, it's from the Greek grammar. The participle tells us, and the order of the actions is that while we are rejecting Christ, we are the slaves of the sin. The first, the sin, refers to rejecting Christ. The second, the sin, refers to the sin nature. We see this harmonized throughout Scripture. Both Jesus, Paul, Peter, uh, John, they identify the sin nature by this designator, the sin. Romans chapter 8, or Romans chapter 6 really, through 8. All identify the sin nature by this specific designation. But if we reject Christ while we do so, we continue to be the slave of sin. The word slave there is doulos, and it means a bondservant, one who willingly submits his free will to another. So the sin nature for unbelievers is the one whom they obey. They have no other. And while they continue to reject that Jesus is the Christ, they continue to have that same master. We were born as humans this way because of the fall. That's why we started with, I remember a time, according to God's word, when which you, in which we were not enslaved to sin. We're born with a sin nature, we're enslaved to it. It's the only master over us, and we will be judged by it should we remain in condemnation. Because remember, as Jesus tells Nicodemus in John chapter 3, Jesus didn't come into the world to judge the world, but to save it. In fact, that's not the purpose that God sent him. Look at what John three seventeen and following say. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light is come into the world. Verse 19. And men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Coming to the light, 
And that terminology there in John chapter 3 talks about those who seek to the truth of what God has revealed. And remember, he's talking in a time period where the Jews are the focal point of God's plan for man. Where they are the stewards of God. And so you had different Jews, Jews that were following the traditions of men and Jews that were following the Mosaic law. Those who wanted truth. Those who were pursuing it. And so he says, those of you who do will come to me. Those of you who don't will not step into the light for fear that your deeds will be exposed as having, been, having not been wrought in God. So Jesus tells us this principle, this basic law that governs every aspect of human life, that those who have rejected Christ and continue to reject him, that while they do so, they are the slaves of their sin nature. That's not the story for those that Jesus was starting, started talking to when he was interrupted by the question of how, shall, how can you say we will become free? Because for those that he was talking to, they have been set free because they were believing Jews. And he says, you have been set free from this. You walk with me and abide in my word and you will be continued to be set free in the future from each and every fallen thought. From each and every desire of your flesh. Romans 6, 18 for the believer tells us that we've been freed from the sin nature's authority. Simply Paul writes, and having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. The word freed there means to be loosened, to be unbound. You can picture the idea of a, a cat, person who's been kidnapped, wrapped up in rope and tied to something. And when their rescuer comes in, they cut the ropes and they slip them off and they are released from their captivity, released from the bondage of those ropes. By placing our faith in Christ to have paid the penalty for our sins, we've been set free from the authority of the sin nature. And that would not come to us if we were not identified with the death of Christ. Because he has died on our behalf to sin. And by his, his death, he has overcome the sin nature. He's overcome the judicial penalty for sin and the authority of the sin nature over man. And so when Jesus tells the, the Jews in John eight thirty four that the ones who commit the sin, rejection of him, are the slave of sin, there is hope for us because we recognize from Romans six eighteen. In Romans 6, 5 to 7, that if we have become united in the likeness of his death, combined together with the death of Christ in the moment we believed, that we also then have hope for resurrection. And verses 6 and 7 say, Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with. Future, not present. It will be done away with in the future, the body of sin. But we were also crucified with him, verse 7 says, so that we would no longer be slaves, for he who has died is freed from sin. If you have trusted Christ to have paid the penalty for your sins and you have died with him, he has defeated the power of sin over you. You've been set free from the responsibility for your sin nature's actions through you and your consent and participation with it. And it's no longer your master you are no longer its slave. Now, though, we have a new master, and that is righteousness. And if it was so simple as that, then we would be able to walk as Adam and the woman in the garden walked before the fall freely, enjoying all that God had given us. But remember, they did not have us in nature, but we do. So while we've been set free from it, we still have to combat it. We still have to deal with it. And if we're going to deal with it, if we're going to deal with the thing that takes our freedom in Christ to serve and glorify him and enjoy the partnership and fellowship we have with him, if we're going to be able to deal with that loss, we have to understand what it is within us that takes us when we consent to its suggestions out of fellowship with God and away from that freedom that we have received in Christ. So we're going to look at, with the time remaining, 
this sin nature. And there are three major components to it. We are to walk with God, and as we walk with God, the sin nature is the tool used by Satan coming to tempt us out of and away from walking with God. And they use this thing called a lust pattern. The desire you and I have to consume specific things. And so we'll look at that. Our sin nature also is affected by this thing called its area of strength. Which for us sounds like a good thing. Yeah, it's a strength. No, it's the sin nature's strength. You don't like it. <laughs> it's still sin. So we'll look at that. And then there's also this thing called the area of weakness. We don't want to look at that, but we will. Because it's a part of this sin nature that we have been set free from as believers. We don't have to any longer listen to the sin nature's suggestions. We don't have to any longer follow the lusts that the sin nature gives, up, gives out. We don't have to any longer seek to please people rather than God by our sin nature. We don't have to any longer be tripped up and entangled by the sin that our area of weakness and our sin nature produces so that we fail to run the race with endurance moment in and moment out. So turn with me, if you would, to 1 John chapter 2. As we begin to explore the three major components of the sin nature, starting with the lust pattern. Should have some of those of our youth group come up here and present the rest of this lesson. One was brave enough to make eye contact with me. They've been learning this recently as we've been walking them through the basics starting the first Tuesday in January of this year. It finally got us out of this in nature. I, I have a hard time getting out of it. It's a good study. But you guys are safe because I don't want anyone else to have to teach this. I get to do it. 1 John 2, 16 to 17. There's three categories given. I've mentioned them to you before. Hopefully they come quickly to your recollection as we discuss them again. Your lust pattern is the area of your sin nature that desires to consume certain things. The word lust is a desire to consume, to possess, to enjoy, to uh, experience something. And so in this passage, 1 John 2, 16 and 17, we see that there are two specific lusts mentioned and then one that is a mentality, but it produces lust. And we're told it's not from the Father, but from the world. Let's take a look at what John writes in 1 John 2, 16 to 17. He says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away and also its lusts, but... The one who does the will of the Lord, the will of God abides forever. We see again the contrast between those who abide in the message of Christ, those who do the will of God, and those who do not. All that is in the world comes down to these three things. And we can love these things or we can reject these things from having any claim upon our thoughts or our life. But here are the three categories of things which are in the world. The first one is identified as the lust of the flesh. It's a desire to consume those things which satisfy the body's desires. Which satisfies the senses and produces inside of us a feeling of enjoyment. We have five senses. And through those senses, our body is satisfied. We can look at things that look good. We can taste things that taste good. We can hear things that sound pleasant to our ears. Which is why much of this isn't taught in today's churches. We can touch things that feel good. And there's always one that we leave out. We can smell those things which smell so good. Five senses. And when you smell something good or bad, does it not produce a response in you? 
It does. <laughs> when you taste something good or bad, does it not produce a response within you? Your body, it does. But also within the thoughts of our mind. You don't even have to actually do the tasting to get the feeling that it, that taste would produce. You can think about how good it would taste. Lunchtime's coming, right, ladies? <laughs> you can think about it. Which is why we get into so much trouble when we're left even in a dark room by ourselves, with nothing to distract us, no other person, because our thoughts can bring forth feelings within us. The lust of the flesh refers to that thing that we call sensuality. Satisfying the body's desires through its senses. We also have then the lust of the eyes. This is simply materialism. Desire to consume that which you can see in front of you. Whatever that object may be, it's a focus on the qualities and the, the characteristics of that physical possession. The stuff that's out there. Materialism, lust of the eyes. And there's this thing called the boastful pride of life. And uh, you can look at a number of different translations. They all seem to have a difficult time translating it. It's, it's a tricky passage to translate, to be certain. The word boastful, pride, those two words from the New American Standard come from the Greek word alizonia. It's a mentality, a thought process, a mindset that puts the focus on oneself and prioritizes oneself more than anything else. Pride of life. Pride. Ego. We've all known or been people that have been seen to be conceited. Who thought everything revolved around them. And that the world should bow at their feet. They felt entitled perhaps. Or perhaps they felt completely and utterly worthless and that they couldn't be any good to anything or anyone. All of these are self-centered thoughts that put oneself in the forefront, in the focal point. These are all part of the lust patterns. And why do I keep saying pattern? Because if you look at the course of your life, if you look at the motivations behind your actions... And if we were to spend more time studying out the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, then you would be able to see which one of these is more dominant in your walk apart from God. You perhaps might pursue those things which satisfy your senses and do so more than that which is pleasing to your eyes the stuff that's out there, or then pride. You perhaps may be more prideful than sensual or materialistic can help you understand those things, but it takes more study. And that's not the purpose of this study this morning. But one of these is more dominant in you than the others. They're all there. It's not just, oh, I have a desire for pride more than I do for sensuality or materialism, therefore it's not there at all. No, they're like singers on a stage. One's the main vocalist and the other two are the backup singers. They're all present. They all shine in their own different ways in their own different times, but one is dominant. The lust patterns. It's a part of your sin nature. Every sin that is done in this world comes from these, one of these three lust pattern categories. Turn over then to Colossians 2. Colossians 2, we get to see a glimpse of this thing called human good produced from our area of strength. So the first category is lust pattern. There's three different types of lust. One is dominant in your life. This is a part of your sin nature. This is why even though you have sworn off that you will never, ever, ever, ever do that again, that it comes up inside of you and you say, okay, fine. And it's the okay, fine. After you tried by your own strength, by your own willpower, by your own determination to fight that desire, we find that that actually comes to this Colossians 2 passage. Colossians 2.20 to 23. So we're we're done with the lust patterns for now. That's probably, if you can mark this down in your Bibles or on your bulletin, put the date, the time. This is the shortest amount of time I've ever spent on the lust patterns of the flesh. Some of you guys are saying amen. We're moving now to the area of strength, which again sounds good because what do we as humans like? We like our strengths, but this is a sin nature. It's not, as, it's not a righteous strength. 
It's not a divine strength. It's a human sinful strength. Now, the area of strength, to summarize it, it's what's responsible for producing for us those things which seem good to man. Notice to man in that summary. The area of strength is what produces what seems good to man. The teachings and those standards that man produces. Let's take a look at Colossians 2, 20 to 23. It says, If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to the things destined to perish with the using, in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men? These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion, self-abasement, and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. That last line, they are of no value against fleshly indulgence. Keeping ourselves from things that man says is good or bad is of no value against fleshly indulgence. Colossians 2.20 starts off, says, If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, the church of Colossae had died. In fact, the Greek text is a first-class conditionalist, if, meaning since you have died. If, as is reality, you have died to these principles of this world, then why do you submit yourself back to its decrees? You're dead to these things. Don't go back to them. We see and understand then clearly from this passage and our own walk that we, while we've been separated from the authority of this nature, we can go back to it and resubmit ourselves to what it says and suggests. And if we're unclear about that, we just need to look at our walk. Because it has no rightful authority over us. It's been severed, but we continue to let it lead us. Paul puts a number of different things in this statement. The question he is asking is almost overshadowed by them. He says, why as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees? And we're going to pause there and catch back up in the middle of verse 22. In accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. Why is it, as believers in Christ, that we care about the commands, the instructions, and the teachings of man? Why do we submit ourselves to man's instruction concerning what's right and wrong? Why do we can submit ourselves to man's teaching regarding what we should say, what we shouldn't say, what we should wear, what we shouldn't wear? You want an example of this? You just lived it the last year. Why has there been so much frustration surrounding the responses of local and state and federal government policies? Because one man says you've got to do this, one man says you've got to do that, and they contradict each other. And then apart from that, just on a human citizen-to-citizen -citizen level, we each have the right to believe and pursue that which we, under God's judgment, believe we should pursue in our relationship with him. So for some, that means to wear a mask. For others, that means to not wear a mask. And what have we seen from that? Well, no, you should because if you don't, then you're selfish. And no, you shouldn't because you should stand for freedom. You see the argumentation. All the commandments and teachings of men. None of those things matter. What God has established, what God defines, that's what will set you free. We should not submit ourselves to decrees that tell us by man's standards what we as Christians who have died to the elementary principles of the world should be living by and under. And we certainly have to suss those things out. We have to bring through the teachings of men and compare them to God's word so that we don't just blindly follow authorities wherever they tell us to go, but so that we also respect the authorities in the area that God says we are to respect them. There is balance. And why do we do so? Out of obedience to God, not to the commandments and teachings of men. God created us all with free will. It's the first divine established concept. You and I as individuals get to choose where we go and what we do, and we do so under God and directly under his authority. And in obedience to him, all other authorities, wives to your husbands, bride of Christ to Christ, employees, to their employers, citizens to their governments, all of these things, they all fit under his authority first. 
But man says, no, these are our commands and our teachings, and you must follow them. We are dead to them. We have died with Christ to them, so we should not focus on the commandments and teachings of men, but rather the commandments and teachings of God. If we want to be bondservants of God, Galatians, Paul tells us that we cannot strive to please men, but we have to strive to please God. And that's what this area of strength does. It seeks to please man. You can summarize this, if, if you want, by just making it, calling it a people-pleasing category of our sin nature. Its focus is to satisfy the desires and the demands of man so that man is pleased with your actions. As a result, to have a good opinion of who you are. Huh? If you want man to like you, you must do what man wants you to do. But we should not be concerned with whether man likes us. We are bondservants of Christ, are we not? And if we find that we are not following God's commands, but we are following the teachings and commands of man, then we confess that sin, and we get back in fellowship with God, and we walk by his word, and we are set free from the sin nature, which produces this desire within us to please man rather than God. No more time for that. I'm sorry. The last part of it, though, I do want to bring up, verse 23, it says, These have the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. Why is it so easy to fall victim to the human perspective? Because it has an appearance of wisdom. But it's worthless. It's worthless. Flip over then to Hebrews chapter 12 as we... look at that third part of our sin nature that we have been set free from. It's that area of weakness. It's 11.32. I guess we'll dismiss and we'll leave this off, right? No. No. We want to not talk about the area of weakness because it shows where we are most vulnerable the area of weakness is that place in our sin nature that produces in us those things we call personal sin, overt sin. The actions we know God says are wrong, but still we do without any care. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 say, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance, endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The area of weakness of our sin nature is enshrined in that first verse. We see its effect and its production in us where we are commanded to lay aside every encumbrance. That's a weight that impedes our progress towards an objective. If you're trying to go swimming and go diving, you need a little bit of weight if you're scuba diving to get down to a certain depth. But if you need to get out of the water, you don't have to wait for the nitrogen to get out of your blood at different levels on the way up. You've got to cut that weight and get out of there. If you're on a boat and the anchor is being let down and it wraps around your ankle, You've got to find a way to get out of that because it's going to impede your progress of living <laughs> when it pulls you all the way to the bottom. Or if you're a runner, as the example is put before us in Hebrews, attempting to run with endurance the plan of God for your life that he has set out for you to fulfill those works that he has produced and set before you to fulfill. Sin is the weight that holds you back from completing his objectives for you. It's an encumbrance, an onklong is the Greek word, and it means a weight that's Im- that impedes progress towards an objective. Runners use drag chutes in training or uh, sleds that they can push or pull behind them with weight on them to help get some strength built up, but they would never put that on when they ran the real race because it would impede their objective. Sin impedes our objective, and this sin that so easily entangles us that Hebrews talks about is that specific category of sin that our lust pattern likes, that within that category, these things surround us so as to take hold of us and trip us up.
We are to participate in laying these, these, these things aside. Your area of weakness of your sin nature is that place that produces in you that attitude that says, I don't care if this is wrong. I'm going to do it anyway. And I don't care what anyone thinks, including God, about that. It doesn't care about what man thinks. It doesn't care about what God thinks. It cares about doing what it wants when it wants to. When the elder board was able to wrestle some things out together regarding our response to the government's policies upon us as a church and a body of Christ and a local congregation, we sought to not people please, but also to not out of rebellion just say we're not going to do anything here. Instead, we recognize that there is a role, there is a place for what is going on around us. And let's not do things out of the area of strength of the flesh, but let's not also do things out of the area of weakness of the flesh. We're not going to seek to please man over God, but we're also not going to rebel against man and say, you can't tell me what to do. We're going to follow him. And we still work through those conversations. As many of you have worked through those conversations in the privacy of your own homes, and sometimes out in the public square with others around you. Sin nature, we, you have been set free from. If you have trusted Christ to have paid the penalty for your sins, it has no judicial power over you. It has no actual power over you, except if you will now go back and submit yourself to it once more. It has a lust pattern. It has an area of strength. It has an area of weakness. But whatever production of your sin nature, we have an answer as believers. Confess your sins, and he is faithful and righteous to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And so today, as we memorialize the lives that were given of Americans so that you and I could gather here and continue to do so from the revolution up until this moment, let us not forget the victory that Jesus Christ one over sin and death. In memory of freedom, let us focus on the race fixed before us. Let us look into the lust patterns, the area of strength, the area of weakness, and let us stop allowing those things to deceive us and impede our progress toward the objective of satisfying and pleasing God by faith. It's all that we have been made live to do. And it takes us back to the freedom that God had established in the garden. Let's pray. Almighty God, you have brought forth into this world a Savior. One who has the ability through his blood that he shed on our behalf. Delivered us from the sin nature that we have. And in your omniscience and in your wisdom... You did not remove that from us in that moment that we believed, but you gave to us all that we need to abide in the message of your Son, to walk step by step with you, and to continue as we do so and allow your word to renovate our thinking, allow it to change our beliefs, allowing it to guide our standards and the protocols that we operate in. You did so with all those things in mind that we could be set free from what the sin nature had taught us and trained us in from our birth until our spiritual birth. May we be quick, Father, to recognize where we are walking, to recognize who we have made our master in and out of every moment, knowing that the ones that we present ourselves to as slaves for obedience whether it's sin resulting in separation from you or whether it's righteous or obedience resulting in righteousness, that we will be recompensed for such. Thank you that those times, so often as they are, so frequent and long in duration, in which we walk apart from you, that those times are just burnt up and they are not held against us. But may we be faithful to walk by the light of your word under the Spirit's leading to do your will out of the freedom we have in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.